hi. How are you? Good. How are you? It's good to meet you. So, uh, Sam, he, uh, we just had Christopher join. Uh, so, Christopher Missling is the president and CEO of uh, Anavex Life Sciences Corporation. Uh, he has over 20 years of healthcare industry experience within uh, both the uh, large pharmaceutical and the biotech industry. Prior to joining uh, Anavex, he served as uh, the officer at uh, served as an officer at uh, Curis and Immunogen, and previously at Aventus, which is now Sanofi. Christopher's work is dedicated to finding potential cures for rare neurodevelopmental diseases like Rett syndrome and autism spectrum disorder, as well as degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease by utilizing precision medicine. Dr. Missling is working with his team to advance new potential uh, treatments through clinical trials involving the respective advocacy groups uh, early on. Dr. Missling has an MS and PhD from the University of Munich in chemistry and an MBA from Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'd just like to uh, upload the presentation. I don't know if I'm able to do that. That's perfect. So let's get started. So we'll uh, share with you um, clinical trials for rare diseases. Uh, what are the challenges and opportunities? And that's... Uh, based on a case study, uh, which we uh, actually went through really literally until a few weeks ago um, in a rare disease called Red Syndrome. Let's go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Just a brief introduction. What is a rare disease? Uh, the definition is based on the number of patients. Um, it's designed differently in different countries, uh, US, European Union, and Japan. And next slide, please. Uh, rare disease is actually not that uh, small as, as we think. There are 7,000 uh, designated rare diseases as of today, and probably there are more will be found. And about 30 million Americans are afflicted by rare diseases, and most of them uh, are children. Next slide, please. What's also interesting is that it is um, so far 80% of all rare diseases are genetically uh, triggered, and uh, that's why the analysis of genes are one of the most important things going forward. And I think it's not only for rare diseases, we believe. Next slide, please. What you see here is that the designation for rare diseases is accelerating over time in all the three major regions, US, European, Europe, and Japan. Next slide, please. You see that also the approvals uh, of uh, orphan designation uh, diseases uh, indications are increasing, and so are sales, which is now 20% of the overall pharmaceutical industry, which is quite a large number. Next slide, please. What's very interesting is that with the exception of the genetic background of rare diseases, the entire development of rare diseases for approval is really uh, remarkably similar to um, a disease which is not rare, and it showed in this slide. Next slide, please. And I think it was covered before. I want to go quickly through it, but there are developmental pathway expenditures, exp expedited ways, which allows for uh, to motivate a sponsor to develop a drug for rare diseases, which is fast track break to designation, accelerated approval, and priority review. Next slide, please. And that is more. Uh, clearly shown in this slide. Next slide, please. Well, it's also interesting, despite the clear financial legislative you know, inducements, uh, there's still important um, incentive to work with the key opinion leaders and caregivers, because ultimately that's where the um, information and access to patients are coming from. Next slide, please. We have now found that there are different uh, challenges in rare diseases and was probably also covered before uh, in talks today. By necessity, clinical trials in rare diseases enroll small samples because they're rare. But also, there's a low there's a there's a low um, chance of, of finding patients which are homogeneous, and they're very often heterogeneous in their phenotype. And that makes it really difficult to find the right design uh, which you need in order to successfully execute a study, which is still a requirement of having two successful studies to begin with. 
So how you handle that? Next slide, please. Among the challenges is also to be able to um, find the sites which are knowledgeable about this disease, finding investigators who are knowledgeable about, about these rare diseases, and then also finding rigorous endpoints which are appropriate for this rare disease. So it's a lot of challenges. Of the natural history studies are not helpful because they don't measure uh, changes, uh, measures of, uh, of uh, phenotype which are relevant for patients in rare diseases, but some of them are. So you find a mixed bag here. What we um, have noticed, and that it's captured in the next slide, is that the, the basic principle, however, of running a trial are really literally exactly the same as a trial in a non-ray diseases. You have, to, um, you have to develop design, you have to make a regulatory submission, you have to find the sites, you have to recruit the patients, you have to collect the data, and you have to uh, find uh, resources to, uh, to exercise, execute the trial. So what we have found in the next slide, um, please, is that you really have to start with a very valid scientific hypothesis because we believe in rare diseases, you have a very low, um, uh, um, you have a very uh, high chance of um, impairing the patients in the population's perception because there are not that many patients. So you cannot just give it a shot. You really want to be very dedicated in identifying the scientific rationale of your drug and then also validate the protocol with the parents or the patients, um, a caregiver, which often uh, are needed in these rare diseases, to make sure that you can execute the trial. And we have done that, actually. So we went to the advocacy group of Red Syndrome and we asked the parents of these girls, um, you know, what is it what bothers them the most? And we found that one of the things they provided feedback was they don't like to travel. So we made sure that in the protocol, there was an option to also have all the visits instead of in the, in to, uh, send them to a site to do that at their home. And that allowed us to have actually during COVID actually a very flexible trajectory of an over-enrollment uh, because of that option was obviously preferred and uh, that helped us a lot. The next thing is that you want to uh, keep the uh, motivation of the investigator up as well as the, the parents uh, and the family of the respective disease. Next slide, please. So the key thing we, we believe really is is it sounds simple, but it's actually the most important one to really collaborate with all parties. Next slide, please. So the most important thing is to really focus on the patient because most um, uh, looked after is always vulnerable, is always like in a inferior position. He often has no ability, like in Red Syndrome, to make his own decisions. So you really oft I have to really make sure that you are taking care of the patients as a focus. Next slide, please. And these are the ingredients to do that. You want to make sure you develop a good relationship with all the investigators, with all the key opinion leaders, with the advocacy group, and which themselves have a good relationship with the families, and be honest and transparent, offer them the uh, information that after the trial is finished, that an open label will be available. These are all things which are very important to cover the logistics and make it easy for getting informed consent and getting a trial up and running. Next slide, please. And this goes beyond uh, the, um, uh, the patients and the caregivers and the parents' uh, point of view. You also have to eventually uh, consider... Uh, moving into discussing uh, your trial with payers, uh, with um, the larger group of people, with the regulatory, bod regulatory bodies around the world, even in, in places where you don't have yet uh, sites uh, set up. Next slide, please. One of the key features we believe which was integral of our success 
was the strong collaboration with the advocacy group. Uh, we were very fortunate that, uh, in our case, the Red Syndrome Foundation has been instrumental even to get the data of the trial of the indication uh, to begin with. So we were fortunate that we were supported, sponsored by the Red Syndrome Foundation to test our compound in an animal model of Red Syndrome, which led to the positive outcome, which then led to their support in a clinical study, uh, which was then successfully completed. So very early on, dialogue, open dialogue with the patient advocacy group was one of the most fundamental things. And I'm so pleased about that, that continues uh, beyond that. Uh, and we're regularly uh, in contact. And also we reached out to advocacy groups outside of the US to build the same framework and relationship. Next slide, please. So again, that summarizes uh, what I just said, that the, the logistics is also covered. They know uh, transportation, they organize and help transportation to sites. They help and educate the patients and the patients' uh, caregivers. They help and support and provide input to the protocol. And without them, we couldn't do this. And I would never ever en 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 engage in an indication or a trial, sort of trial without that prerequisite. Next uh, slide, please. Um, and also, this is important that you need a very strong CRO who have the same mindset as you to help the patients. Because this is a critical part of the clinical study that they can leverage from experience and, um, and, and doing trials because it requires just more hand-holding than other studies. And again, I mentioned that often it's hard to find even trial sites because it's a rare disease. There is not like it's the 150s study like in, in, a, in a disease like Parkinson, but it is like a very first or few studies ever um, done in this indication. So that requires a lot of um, uh, coordination by the CRO. So a very uh, knowledgeable and 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 educating and patient CRO is very important and, mot and motivated CRO. Next slide, please. please. Well, also what we included in our... Next slide, please. What we included in our design and integrated in our execution of the data analysis was using um, integrated artificial intelligence analysis, uh, which is beyond the clinical trial execution. So using all available data, including gene data, uh, was used to feed into a large artificial intelligence model and modeling tool in order to get more data out of this relatively small number of patients. Um, I would encourage doing that in, in rare diseases. So what we call, and that's described in the next slide, the integration of digital solutions in such a platform that allows to uh, get more uh, data points and intelligence out of the trial, which is then not just a one-off, but it, you're able to learn much more than you would otherwise if you would not integrate uh, such uh, analytical tools uh, after analysis. On the next slide, uh, I'd like to go more into detail of now of what I mentioned in the case study of Anavex 273 in this rare disease called Red Syndrome. And on the next slide, please, you see the overview of the, the rare disease pipeline of the Anavex 273 compound, which is not limited to Red Syndrome, but we started with Red Syndrome which now we have three studies ongoing, but the next uh, planned studies would be in the indications uh, in the slide, which is infantile spasm, polysomy, fragile X, Ingeman syndrome, and another undisclosed uh, rare disease as well. And we are basically uh, happy that we learned the lessons from the red syndrome and we're successfully to apply um, most of the things I just mentioned to you uh, by intuition, but now we have much better um, knowledge on really what things which have worked and which didn't. And we are very rigorously applying these to these other indications. Next slide, please. Red syndrome, a, a brief introduction um, 
Um, what Rett syndrome is, it's a rare disease caused by genetic dysfunction, a mutation of one gene called the MACP2 gene, and occurs almost exclusively in girls. It leads to severe impairments that affect the entire life. They cannot speak, they cannot talk, they cannot walk, they cannot uh, do daily uh, things, and it's a very, it's a horrible disease. Uh, but these girls um, are run about 10,000 in the U.S., six to 9,000 registered, and um, uh, the same amount is uh, in Europe and the same amount, again, in Japan. So worldwide, probably 50,000. And it's what's also very um, heartfelt is that this is not a genetically disease which is passed on by the parents. It's actually a genetically disease which is spontaneously caused. So uh, you cannot prevent it. And uh, that is what makes it also so uh, un, uh, uh, so difficult uh, to prevent. So let's go to the next slide, please, which is the first data readout of this phase two study. Um, we had 20, 20, 31 patients. There are six patients in an open label uh, to get intelligence on the safety. And then we moved into the placebo control study of 25 patients. Um, and then we offered an extension study of 12 weeks, which was just extended by the FTA to uh, 36 weeks. And the measures are global severity of RSPQ, Red Syndrome Behavioral Questionnaire, as well as the CGI, the Clinical Global Impression Improvement Score, as well as others. Next slide, please. So what is very nice to see that both these clinically very important endpoints uh, sanctioned by the FDA or, or agreed with the FDA, the RSPQ and the CGI showed a statistically significant uh, effect of the drug in uh, in the in the study, which it makes it extremely intriguing because uh, the next studies um, will be with higher doses as well as um, with younger patients. And there's a um, there's a rule that in developmental diseases often the hardest to treat patients are those which are older, and you often don't find even a signal. In fact, we found one is very um, uh, encouraging for the upcoming studies. The next slide shows extremely nice uh, safety signal. There was no serious adverse event. We found uh, a very um, uh, uneventful adverse event profile, which was uh, similar in placebo arm as well as in the active arm. Uh, so extremely well-tolerated drug and all patients finished the study as well as all patients moved into the extension study, which I think uh, we understand it's, it's a good sign. Next slide, please. It was really also another very important factor which we integrated in our study early on, uh, which I would highly recommend if you can, because that's really the question, if it's available, to include a biomarker of response, because with that you have a much rigorous uh, foothold into having a um, confirmation of the effect of the drug which we luckily were able to find in our case. Next slide, please. So in summary, the clinical development and research in rare diseases is challenging and difficult. However, we believe very rewarding because seeing the faces of the parents and the, and the, and the kids and the girls that they are doing better again, it's, it's such an uh, uh, uplifting uh, um, uh, feature collaboration across many different stakeholders. Patient center is important. Optimized patient participation and retention is a focus for the CRO. And um, ultimately, it's a group uh, effort from the sponsor, from the CRO, the patient advocacy, and also from the parents, that the collective mission to improve the health of those suffering from these rare diseases is, uh, can be accomplished. With that, um, I'd like to finish. Next slide, please. Uh, we are also treating other indications beyond Alzheimer and with on rare diseases. We are having a uh, focus also on Alzheimer and Parkinson. And on the next slide, we'd like to inform you that we're very privileged that we were invited. We were invited to participate as a panel at a panel of the Rare Disease Day at the NIH next week on Monday. And you can uh, participate. It's for free. You can log in. It's on that um, website link on the bottom of uh, this slide. 
with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, and give back to you. And I'm glad it worked out with the slides. Well, Christopher, thank you very much. That was a terrific presentation, and uh, I, 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 you know, I completely agree with you that that uh, patient advocacy groups and KOLs are are, are key to uh, the successful uh, uh, identification or recruitment of. Uh, of patients, what, what, uh, many of these rare disease um, uh, communities uh, have, you know, a lot of uh, uh, online presence. And I'm, I'm wondering about: uh, uh, Have you used social media to to, to reach out to these uh, uh, to these groups as well? Yeah. So we did uh, not do it ourselves. We did it through the advocacy group, which did mm -hmm. inform to Facebook and social media about the trial and where to, you know, enroll the website. RedSyndromeTrial.com. So that was the the use by the advocacy group. Very important aspect to help recruitment. I agree. Yep. No, that's terrific. Um, Sam, I think uh, uh, you know uh, no other questions from from me. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, really, thank you very much for your time. This was a terrific presentation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, Christopher, you guys have a part. The so Michael. Uh, Fox Foundation, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, right. In addition to Red Syndrome Foundation, we have the partner for Parkinson now with Michael Fox Foundation to support us into the trials and the uh, further advancing the drug in Parkinson disease. Wonderful, wonderful. Sounds great. So we appreciate again your time this afternoon. And uh, with that said, I will be transferring everyone to the next session, uh, which is early. Thank you.